Okay, uh, welcome to lecture here. Uh, <clears throat> get started in just a sec here. We're continuing on in uh, chapter three there. I'm sure you do put it here in the chat box. Remember, we're gonna do some lecturing and then uh, we will stop early and we will take the quiz at that point at around, probably around 6.30 there. Let's get everybody in here. Okay, those just coming in again, uh, we're going to continue on lecturing <clears throat> and then we will get to uh, the quiz afterwards. All right, so we're in chapter uh, three here. We started talking about matter, some uh, different states of matter. Um, so I think this is about where we left off. couple of things out of my way here so I can actually see. All right, let's do that. Okay, so remember that uh, when we talk about matter, it's basically anything that sort of occupies space and has mass, which is, you know, pretty much everything. Um, <clears throat> and matter, as we saw sort of in the, the last slide before this, can be broken up into several sort of categories that we're going to talk about could have pure substances uh, that can be elements or compounds uh, could also be mixtures as we'll talk about as well that could be homogeneous type mixtures or heterogeneous type mixtures uh, again we're going to talk about obviously all of those things here in uh, this chapter so let us then talk about sort of pure substances a pure substance is basically any substance that is basically you know, one particular uh, substance by itself. Uh, it's a type of matter with a fixed or definite composition. Uh, it could be an element. Um, it could be a compound. So there are obviously uh, pure substances it could be an element. So if you have just iron metal by itself, that would be Fe. And if you had just solid iron by itself or solid copper by itself, that is a pure substance. There are certain elements that do come as diatomic molecules, like hydrogen gas, oxygen gas, fluorine gas, uh, chlorine, bromine, um, iodine, nitrogen. These are basically how these guys come, and these are all elements. Um, if you just had these guys by themselves, that would obviously be a pure substance. Uh, these guys are what are referred to as being diatomic molecules. So again, what that means is um, <clears throat> something like oxygen is basically two oxygen atoms bound together, something like hydrogen, two hydrogen atoms bound together. Um, a pure substance can also be a compound. So if you have something like water, H2O, if you had just water by itself, uh, that is a pure uh, substance. Nothing else mixed in there. Two hydrogens, one oxygen basically makes up water there. Um, you know, you could have something like salt, for example, sodium chloride, which is NaCl. I just got to wait for something to get out of my way here. There we go. Chose the wrong spot to write. Get that out of my way. Uh, so something like NaCl, which is basically salt, sodium chloride, it's a pure substance. If you had it just by itself, also would be a compound. So uh, these guys are compounds. And I, I believe we talked about it, sort of the difference between a, a compound and a molecule. Remember, a molecule is basically just a, a general definition of two or more atoms together. So that's why H2O2, F2, these are all molecules. Um, water is also a molecule as well because it basically has two hydrogens for every one oxygen. But water and sodium chloride, these guys are also compounds because a compound is the combination of two or more, oops, two or more atoms of different elements. So I had a quick question, Professor. Can a compound uh, and a molecule be the same? It, it, it can. Uh, so, it wins, right? yeah, it can. So uh, like what we're talking about right here, water. 
Water meets the definition of a molecule because it's basically two or more atoms together. So, you know, it basically has, you know, uh, three atoms that are there, two hydrogens and one oxygen. It is also a compound because it actually meets that definition because it's two or more elements together. So you've got both oxygen and hydrogen that are present. Now, um, something like say O2 that I drew down here. O2 also is a molecule because again, it meets the definition of two or more atoms. It has two atoms of oxygen together. But because both of those atoms are the same element in this case, this is not a, this would not be a compound because it's made up of the only one element. And because it's made up of only one element, even though it's a molecule, it's actually going to be an element and not, uh, <clears throat> not a compound. So a compound is something that has at least two or more elements together, but a, uh, a molecule is really, you could think about a molecule as almost like a, just a basic definition of just simply two or more atoms together. And those atoms can be the same, which is how we get molecules that are elements, or they can be two or more atoms of different elements, which is how we get things that are also known as compounds. That sort of makes sense. Other questions on that? Yeah, so uh, a compound can be a molecule and a molecule can be an element, but you cannot have an element that's a compound, if that sort of makes sense. Again, because the definition of a compound, it has to be at least two or more different elements that are there. Other questions on that? Okay. So a compound, as, as I've been talking about, as I said on the bottom there, again, that's the key distinction between that and a molecule is that it does need to have at least two or more elements involved, but you definitely can have a compound that is a molecule. So here are some examples, obviously, of some elements, copper, lead, aluminum, pretty much anybody you see there on the uh, periodic table. Um, obviously, our compounds here, these are all meet the general basic definition of a compound. We have hydrogen and oxygen, two or more elements, sodium and chlorine, two or more elements, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, three obviously elements, and then obviously our water that has two or more elements. I think we talked about that, but this is the way that we typically do write chemical formulas. Uh, the little number, which is the subscript, goes to the element to the left, and that means in hydrogen peroxide, there's two hydrogen atoms for every two oxygen atoms that are present in that particular case. And just like here in sugar, there would be 12 carbon atoms for every 22 hydrogen atoms for every 11 oxygen atoms. So each of these can be classified uh, as a compound. Most of them can also be classified as a molecule, although some people would say probably this one, maybe not because it's ionic. Um, but this guy here, this one, and this one could definitely also be classified as a molecule. But none of these can be classified as an element because obviously there are more than one element involved in each of those. A compound uh, that contains elements, so table sugar, or I'm sorry, table salt, like sodium chloride, um, usually uh, as obviously contains elements that make it up. So when you do have a compound, you can definitely break it back apart into its elements. But once you get something sort of in its elements, that's as far back as you could go. So you can't break it apart any further than that. So I think I might've used this example earlier on in a lecture, but you know, you could think of the elements almost like uh, the alphabet, right? There's 26 letters but there are lots of different words that you can make based on sort of the combination of those letters that you use. Same idea with sort of the elements. There's only so many elements, a hundred and some odd. And depending on sort of the combination of how those elements come together, you can make many different compounds uh, from them. Also, as we can see in this picture, usually the properties of a compound like table salt are very, very different than the elements that make them up. 
something like sodium chloride, as it shows here, is really made of sodium metal, which is like a soft metal such as this guy right here, and also chlorine gas, which is a toxic, you know, kind of green gas there, not so good gas. And through the miracle there of chemistry, we get something here that obviously we could put on our fries and we won't die. Nobody would want to put chlorine gas on their fries, I imagine. They probably don't want to eat sodium metal, but when these guys do come together, they do make this compound of sodium chloride. And again, it has usually, and that's typically what you see usually is that the compounds have very, very different sort of properties than the actual elements uh, that make them up. Any questions on that? And again, as I mentioned, these are good ones to keep in mind in terms of molecules and elements. Uh, so again, there's these diatomic molecules, which are really elements. And these are, again, how these guys naturally come. So hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, chlorine, bromine, uh, iodine, and fluorine. If you have any of these guys by themselves, not combined with anything else, this is how they come. And again, as these diatomic molecules and all these guys, again, are elements. So if somebody says, hey, you have elemental oxygen or you know molecular oxygen, it is not just O, it actually comes as O2. And again, this is naturally how it it always comes uncombined by itself, basically as two oxygen atoms, basically in a gas form uh, flying around. Any questions on that there? So when we take these sort of pure substances, which again can be either be elements or compounds, we can take two or more pure substances and basically put them together. And when we do that, if we mix two or more pure substances together, they will make a mixture. So a mixture really is that combination of two or more pure substances. And the, the important part about sort of a, a mixture is when they come together, they actually still maintain their identity. And what I mean by that is there's really no sort of chemical change that's happening. When we make mixtures, it really is more of a physical type change. So a very easy example of that, again, if we take some water, which is a pure substance by itself. And if we take sodium chloride or salt, basically, also by itself is a pure substance. But if we put both of these together, we basically get salt water. And when we make salt water, that is a mixture. That is actually a type of mixture as we'll talk about, which is known as a homogeneous mixture. And what that basically means as we'll talk about is, you know, when you look at a homogeneous mixture, after you mix the components together, it kind of looks the same throughout. So what that means, it almost looks like sometimes it's referred to as one phase. Um, everything mixes really well. So for example, if you were at the beach or something and you got some water in a cup that was salt water, you didn't grab anything else floating around there in the beach. Um, when you look at it, honestly, it would just look like pretty much like water to you. You want to be able, obviously, to see the salt in there. But if you taste it, obviously, don't drink salt water. But if you taste it, obviously, you would be able to taste the salt and the salts in there. So in a homogeneous mixture, you know, when we sort of mix those things together, everything mixes really well. Although we can't really see it, it's still there. Uh, we could definitely still see um, or really still taste the, uh, the mixture there of the extra substance. We could also do something like say sand and water. And again, if we mix sand and water, these are both pure substances by themselves, but when we mix it together, we get sand and water. And obviously in that mixture though, you can mix that all day and you're still gonna probably see the sand part of it, right? And the water part. And as we'll see, that is what is known as a heterogeneous mixture. 
and that's basically a mixture where you, if you mix and keep mixing, you basically will see different layers, kind of like what we see here in the picture. If you're making spaghetti, right after you're done boiling the noodles, if you look in there, it's a heterogeneous mixture. You can see the noodles floating in there. You can also see the water that's still in there and you can separate those things out uh, by using a, uh, a little guy here, a colander there to uh, basically separate it. And what happens right when you pour this through, all the water comes through the bottom. And if you wanted to, you could collect all the water as it comes through. And then obviously the solid noodles would be caught up on top and you're able to get back both the um, noodles in their original form. You can also get back the water in its original form as well. So again, we could really retrieve back both of our parts of our mixture by physical means. So when we talk about physical means, that's something like boiling, freezing, you know, those type of processes uh, that allow things to be separated out. You could even do that for, for example, the salt water here. You may not think so, but if you took, for example, the salt water and you kind of put it into a closed environment, maybe connected by a tube here, very bad drawing here, but we'll assume that. There we go. And we'll keep this tube really cold between the two. And if you started to heat up the salt water, right? When you start to heat the water, the water part's gonna start to evaporate. So the steam will basically come up. It's got nowhere to go. So it's gonna follow the path. And once the steam hits that very cold sort of tube between it, it's gonna go through condensation. If you remember condensation is where gas goes back to liquid and we basically will get the water come out on the other side. And if we keep heating the left-hand side, eventually we'll get to a point where all the water will pretty much evaporate off. And what you'll be left with is kind of like a salty residue in the beaker. And at this point through this process, just by heating it, cooling it, we were able to get back both the water and the salt. And again, and when you look at something like a homogeneous mixture like salt water, you can't really see, you know, you can't really see the salt, but it is still there. So there's been no chemical reaction, just a physical reaction or physical change. And a reminder that a physical change basically means what we start with and what we end with are fundamentally the same thing. It may just appear a little different. Maybe it's a different shape. Uh, maybe it's dissolved. But fundamentally, what we start with and what we end with is still the same thing. And that's different than a chemical change. In a chemical change, what we start with and what we end with is different fundamentally. So for example, you know, if you took like a, a log in, right, in a fireplace and you kind of burnt that log in the fireplace, the log is going to change into you know, smoke, uh, obviously ash, all kinds of things. You could do whatever you want, kind of collect all the stuff that's in the fireplace. You probably aren't going to be able to put it all back together, right, and get the log back. That's definitely a chemical type change. Physical type change would be like an ice cube, right? If you take an ice cube and you melt it, it becomes liquid water. You could take that liquid water, put it back in the freezer, and you then could get back your ice. So that's more of a physical change. There is no real difference between ice, which is H2O water and liquid water, which is obviously H2O is still fundamentally the same thing. So in a chemical change, we start with something and we end with something that are fundamentally two different things. And <clears throat> in a physical change, what we start with and what we end with are fundamentally still the same thing. And that's why a mixture is really a physical change because even though it may appear different or like something reacted and something's gone, 
you can definitely get back everything through some type of physical means. Everybody's still there in their original sort of form. A very good way to separate out a solid from a liquid is the process of filtration. And in filtration setup is like what we see here. We have a funnel here. We have filter paper. We obviously have a collection sort of beaker. When we pour something through it, the solid gets trapped on the paper. So all the solid comes through here. The liquid part drips through and gets collected on the bottom. And that's a very, very good way to separate out a solid from a liquid is that process of filtration. So that would be a very good way to separate out, for example, that sand and water type of situation. Again, if we took our sand plus our water and we dumped it into here, the sand would get collected over here on the filter paper, the solid, and again, the liquid part or the water would basically drip through. Filtration, for example, would be a terrible way to try to separate out, say, salt water, right? Because the salt's dissolved in it, if you try to use filtration to separate out your salt water, it's pretty much all gonna just drip through, right? Because the salt's dissolved in it. So that would not be a great way to separate out something like salt water or a homogeneous mixture, but filtration works very well a lot of times for heterogeneous type mixtures. Any questions on that so far? Okay. So uh, as we sort of alluded to the two types of mixtures, again, a homogeneous mixture is one where after sufficient mixing, everything does appear the same throughout. So that's sort of the common word there, same throughout. Uh, you really don't see different layers. Uh, if you look at it, it just looks like sort of one thing, all kind of uniformly mixed together. Um, brass is a homogeneous mixture. Again, if you look at it, all looks the same, but it is a combination of copper and zinc. Air, for the most part, is a homogeneous mixture. The major components of air is nitrogen, and then we have oxygen, uh, carbon dioxide, and other gases, depending on where you're at. But typically, when we look at air, it looks the same throughout, you know, as long as it's not too small, give a day, I suppose. But when we look at air, you know, it, it does look the same throughout, but it really is a mixture of a lot of different elements, uh, you know, things like I mentioned but sometimes people don't know, but the major component of air actually is nitrogen gas followed by oxygen gas. We have things like argon, CO2, and other gases, again, depending on sort of where you're breathing that air, but those are homogeneous mixtures. So something that you put together and it looks the same throughout, it mixes really well, it, it uh, you know looks like one layer and it, it will be a homogeneous mixture. There's another one here of some homogeneous mixtures, again, some combination of different gases. And again, kind of like air, you know, it would look the same. A lot of gases obviously don't have color associated with it. So, you know, there could be multiple gases in a container like a scuba uh, diving container there, but it would look like a homogeneous mixture of a number of gases. Opposite of that, like we just talked about, is a heterogeneous mixture and a heterogeneous mixture. That's basically when you have two or more substances you put together and um, you can mix pretty much all day. Uh, you know, it's eventually going to kind of separate out into different layers or different parts. The different parts are definitely visible to you. Uh, so sand and water is an example. Here's copper and water, right? If you take some pennies, which are basically there, and you throw those into some water. Again, you can mix all day. Those pennies are never going to dissolve in the water. So you'll always see sort of the, the pennies in the water basically as two different layers. This would be something as well, you know, you could filter out. You could pour that through a filter. Ideally, the pennies would get caught on the filter paper. The liquid part would go through. You would then have your pennies in their original state, just like they were. You would also have the water in its original state by letting it go. Oil and water is also a, a homogeneous, uh, I'm sorry, a heterogeneous type mixture, um, or even oil and vinegar sort of salad dressing. Um, but yeah, if you take oil and water, you know, you can mix it, right? And there is a, a 
point where if you mix it or even oil and vinegar salad dressing, for example, you can mix it. And there is a point where the, it kind of looks mixed and it is mixed for a, a little, very short period of time, depending on what the two things are. But if you leave it sort of alone, what you'll eventually see, right, is sort of that oil layer up on top or the water layer up on the bottom. That's why when we have oil spills, right, typically the oil kind of floats on top of the water. There's a lot more sort of to that interaction. But again, something like oil or vinegar salad dressing would be more like a heterogeneous mixture. Again, you can mix it and it does mix for a bit, but at some point they're not able to basically interact with each other. So, uh, and we'll talk about this in a later chapter, but essentially the two layers here for a short period of time has a little bit of a way to interact with each other, but over a long period of time, they have really no way to maintain that interaction. So essentially what we see is they do start to kind of separate out from each other into different layers. And that would definitely be a heterogeneous type mixture. Other questions on that there. <clears throat> All right, so let's take a look at uh, some examples here. We want to identify each of the following as a pure substance or a mixture. So let's take a look at the first one here. We have pasta and tomato sauce. So definitely that is two different substances together. So that would definitely classify as a mixture. And I'm assuming that would be more of a heterogeneous mixture. You usually could see your noodles under your sauce even if you put a lot of sauce on it, I suppose. Uh, aluminum foil, if we had really just straight aluminum foil, that technically would be just aluminum elements in the sense, and that would be a pure substance. Helium is a gas, which is HE. And if you had just say a, a container of helium, it should only contain helium, which would be a pure substance. And again, both of these guys would be also elements, right? This guy would be an element as well. Air, as I sort of mentioned before, is actually a mixture. And this guy, again, would be more of a homogeneous mixture. Again, when you look at air, I don't know how often we look at air, it just you know looks like air were a bad example. But as I mentioned before, it does contain a lot of different sort of elements flying around in there that you know we can't really distinguish. Um, from one or the other. So uh, heterogeneous mixture on the first one, pure substances on B and C, probably elements on both of those, and air again also being a mixture and falling under the category more of a homogeneous mixture. Everything looks the same throughout. Any questions on that there? Uh, so here we're looking for either homogeneous or heterogeneous mixtures. Hot fudge sundae, that is a delicious heterogeneous mixture. Uh, obviously, if you have a nice sundae going on there, uh, you probably got ice cream, whipped cream, hot fudge, some peanuts maybe, some cherries and all that kind of stuff. So that's obviously a heterogeneous mixture. Baby shampoo um, is a homogeneous mixture. You know, usually when you look at something, say like a shampoo, it should kind of look the same throughout, I would imagine. Usually like baby shampoo is like, uh, you know, almost you could kind of see through a lot of it and stuff like that. Uh, sugar water. If we put sugar into water, we would expect the sugar to dissolve. So kind of like our salt water, it would probably just look to us like, eh, it's just water in there, right? And there is definitely sugar that's dissolved in there. But again, we probably wouldn't be able to see it. So that would again classify as a homogeneous mixture. Peach pie, I'm assuming on that, you got some crust, you got some pieces of peach in there probably, some other good stuff, I imagine. And that definitely means that you're probably seeing different layers and that would be a heterogeneous uh, mixture. Any question on the difference between homogeneous or heterogeneous mixtures? And again, no matter which type of mixture you have, you could always separate out into the pure substances. So no matter what type of mixture uh, that you have, it could always be separated out 
by physical means into the pure substances. So again, two ways that we sort of talked about to do that, very common, again, filtration, a good way to do a solid from like a liquid. And the one that I drew there, which is distillation, uh, is a good way to separate it like a homogeneous mixture. And the one I'm talking about is the one where we had the salt water in the tube where we heated it up and it was all enclosed to the other side with that little kind of tubing that's cold. So that's basically distillation when we're doing, doing this process. Again, by heating and cooling, taking advantage of boiling points, melting points and freezing points, it's a very good way to separate out, again, something like a homogeneous mixture um, where you can't really see those different parts. Any questions on any of that stuff there? All right, so let's talk about the states of matter. And I think we probably touched upon it earlier, but again, just to reiterate, there are the different states of matter. So we do have solid and solid things have a definite shape and a definite volume. And for the most part, as I might've drew earlier, we typically do see everybody packed in pretty tight to one another in the solid state. Again, why it has a definite shape, usually very hard to change the shape of it because everybody is very densely packed in there. An exception of that would be ice, again, not super densely packed in. Um, but most things in their solid state are packed in a lot closer than in, they say, their liquid state than obviously in their gas state. Liquids, on the other hand, as we've also talked about, again, uh, fairly in there, pretty close to each other, a little bit more room for movement. Again, this is why they're able to sort of pass each other. And that's why, obviously, as we can see here, and when we know about liquids, we do think of liquids as uh, basically more fluid in nature. It has a definite volume, but not a definite shape. So what that means is, obviously, as we can see in these two pictures, you know, if we fill a liquid in this glass here, it will take the shape of that glass. If we fill it into this glass, it will take that shape. And there's a vase sitting back there. You know, if we put the liquid into one of those kind of silly straws, right, it will take the shape of the silly straws. What it means about having a definite volume is if you had five milliliters of, say, water, and you moved it from a trash can to a cup or a cup, to a beaker or a beaker to a straw, and you really were not a klutz and spilled anything, you should still have five milliliters as you go from one place to the next. Again, uh, you should have that sort of constant volume. And again, unless you're a klutz and you spill it all over the place, then you might run into problems. The last state of matter is gases. Um, and again, when we do reach sort of that gas state, we pretty much have everybody broken apart from one another. They're flying around. They're really banging into the walls of say the container. That's really what causes um, the pressure associated with gases as we'll talk about in a later chapter. They have an indefinite shape and an indefinite volume. They typically will fill the container uniformly and that's because they are flying around. So as they're flying around, they're constantly basically filling that container. And we expect it, you know, to be sort of fully filled, you know. So when we think about, you know, a balloon, there's gas in there, and it is flying around the entire container and filling it uniformly. And that's why also when we get to sort of the gas state, we'll talk about the idea that we usually look at things in terms of gases, in terms of their volume, um, as the volume of the container they're in, not necessarily the volume of the actual gas but the volume of the container in which they are in. We talked about those transitions as we go from solid to liquid to gas This is sort of a summary table, but a reminder as we go right from solid to liquid, that is the process of melting. As we go from liquid to solid, that's the process of freezing, happens at the same temperature. 
as we go from liquid to gas, that's evaporation or vaporization. Going from gas back to liquid is condensation. Also happens at the same temperature, which is the normal boiling point. And I think we also talked about the idea of going solid directly to gas. In the liquid part, that is sublimation. And going from gas directly back to solid, skipping the liquid part, which is deposition. And we're going to talk later in this chapter about sort of energy that's related to those things. But again, this table from your book here has, you know, a lot of the properties that we just talked about. Again, solid being very close to each other. Um, not a lot of room for movement. Liquid, a little bit more room for movement. And then obviously gases are flying all around, really not connected at all. Any questions on the different sort of states there? So again, here, uh, identify each uh, description uh, as either a solid liquid or a gas. So uh, <clears throat> number one has a definite volume, but takes the shape of the container. That is definitely a liquid that will do that. Particles that are moving rapidly, that is our gases. They're completely broken apart from each other. So they're flying around. Particles fill the entire container uniformly. That is also our gases. Because they are flying around, they're filling the whole container they're in uniformly. Uh, particles have a fixed arrangement. Um, particles have a fixed arrangement that is going to be solid. Again, not a lot of room for movement. And lastly, particles are close together, but there is some random movement. Again, they're still pretty close together in the liquid stage. Again, why liquids are fluid, because they do have enough energy to kind of to pass one another. Any questions on any of those? Okay. Uh, and again, identify the states of each of these guys. A tablet obviously would be a solid. Eye drops are usually liquid in form. Sometimes they're kind of a suspension, may have some other stuff in it, but usually liquids. Uh, vegetable oil is obviously a liquid as well. A candle is a solid. And the air in the basketball, not the basketball itself, but the actual air inside is a gas that's flying around. And again, that's why when we feel something like a tire, a, a uh, basketball or whatever it may be, right? We feel it to a certain amount of pressure because at some point as you're filling it with air, the air guys are moving around, moving around, moving around, and they're colliding with the walls of say your basketball or whatever, causing pressure and obviously with each other until you get the right amount of pressure to allow something like the basketball to bounce or your tire to not look flat. Any questions on the different states there? Okay, uh, see here, just to finish a little bit here, uh, we sort of jumped ahead a little bit here earlier, but again, uh, there are certain properties which are basically known as physical properties. And these are really characteristics that are measured without changing the identity of a substance. So when we talk about physical properties, they usually entail when we talk about physical changes. So the idea behind anything sort of physical, either properties or changes is really this, that what we start with and what we end with are still the exact same thing. So things like shape, um, things like state are very common physical properties, solid, liquid, gas is the thing a solid, is it a liquid, is it a gas? Boiling points, freezing points are common physical properties. Density, the color of a substance, also a physical property. Um, and here's an example, for example, of copper. Here are all physical properties. It's reddish orange, it's shiny. It's a good conductor of electricity. It's solid at 25 degrees. This is the melting and boiling point. So these are all properties, for example, of copper that doesn't involve sort of changing what copper is. 
And that does lead us into sort of what I talked about earlier, a physical change is really when we sort of change some aspect of a substance, but we do not change it into something new. So the most common example here is water. You know, if we have ice or we have sort of liquid water on the ground, or if we have steam as we're boiling, even though they may all look different to you, they are all fundamentally still the exact same thing. They are still all fundamentally water, H2O. H2O is solid water, which is ice, liquid water, our gas, which is sometimes referred to as steam, and they all fundamentally are water. The important part about a physical change is you could get back you know, sort of your original substance by some type of physical means. So as I've talked about before, if you take the steam and you kind of cool it down, it will become liquid water. You take the liquid water, put it in the freezer. Boom, you will get your ice cube back just the way it was originally. And again, by basically playing with um, energy and stuff like that, we're able to get back our original substance no matter what. If you take a peanut and you crush it, you still technically have a peanut. It's just all crushed. It's still fundamentally a peanut. It just happens to look different. And that's the importance about a physical change. What we start with and end with, again, exactly the same thing, just may appear different. Any questions on physical changes? If you had a wrinkled shirt and you ironed it, it's still a shirt. It just doesn't have wrinkles in it anymore, right? It's still fundamentally a shirt at that point. Again, uh, as we were talking about a little bit before, when we we're talking about the mixtures, something like salt water. Um, you know, when we dissolve salt in water, it looks like it's gone. It disappeared, but it's still there. And we could evaporate off the water and get back the salt, let it dry out, and you would have the original salt there. And that's why when we talk about sort of a mixture, it's a physical change when we do something like that, because those guys are still there in their original forms. We can usually get them back by some type of physical means. So there has been no chemical change uh, that basically has occurred. And so here, if we look at each of these, we want to classify these as either a change in shape or a change in state. So if we chop up a log, it's still a log. We just really change the shape of it, right? It's smaller pieces of wood, basically. Water boiling in a pot. We start with liquid water in that case, ends up as steam. And that is a change of state. Ice cream melting that is also a change of state. You could technically take your melted ice cream, put it back into the freezer, you would get your ice cream back in its original state. Ice forming in a freezer, same idea. You usually start with liquid water going to solid, right? And that is a change in state. And cutting up dough into strips, that is a change in shape, right? They're all still fundamentally, you know, cookie dough basically, and just different shapes. Any questions on that? Okay, uh, so what we're gonna do is I'm gonna stop here right now and 